welcome to our video service. I'm Pastor Carl Anderson with the Mount Carmel and Trinity Free Lutheran Churches of McIntosh, and we welcome you today. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you now to bless this time and use it for your grace and your glory. Father, that we might hear from you, that we might recognize in you our great God and our Savior, and Lord, that we might be drawn near to call upon you and to walk with you all of our days. Equip us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Isaiah chapter 44 and beginning at verse 21 through 23. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Our gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of John in chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. Just to trust His cleansing blood 
preaching of your word. Use this time now to guide us, to instruct us, and equip us for your service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we closed out looking at the first part of chapter 10 of Romans with that uh, closing statement, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we see from that that there is only one way to heaven. We're reminded of that, that it's by the name of Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven by which men might be saved. We see then that we need to call upon him because all roads don't lead to Jesus. I hear that occasionally. All paths lead to God. No, they don't. Just like not every highway leads to Grand Forks, or not every highway leads to Bemidji. If you're getting on a boat in the harbor, it's going to go to a specific location someplace. It's not going to go to all the locations. And therefore, we need to find that path to God. Jesus said, the way is wide, and it's easy, and it's popular, that leads to destruction, but the way is narrow that leads to life. And so as we consider building upon that, Paul in his letter to the Romans is building upon that idea that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But then why do some not call them? Why are there many who do not call upon the name of the Lord? Well, let's look at our epistle lesson for today from Romans chapter 10 and beginning at verse 14 and see what we can find out about that. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? For Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Heavenly Father, these are your words. Thy word is eternal truth. Sanctify us today in thy truth we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Paul continues here, he notes two sides of the coin that we need to pay attention to. The one side is the proclaiming of the message. How can they believe, how can they call if they have not believed? How can they believe if they have not heard? How can they hear if someone is not sent? 
In a way, he, in the first part of the chapter, climbs the mountain. He looks at the need for belief that then leads us to confess, which then leads us to call out to the name of the Lord. They who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We see that progression of faith that we do need to hear the word. We do need to believe it. We need to confess it. And that leads then to calling out to Jesus, how asking him, we looked at that again last week, how that's a distinct call. It's a, uh, a strong word. It's not just a passive, hi, how you doing? But it's a calling out for help, an appeal of desperation that he is our only hope. But we see, to get to that point, it begins with faith. And the faith doesn't just come out of nowhere. Faith doesn't just appear. It isn't just some liquid that's poured into us, but it's a response. It's a response to hearing God's word. And that to hear God's word, somebody has to take the time to be trained and equipped to properly distinguish the law from the gospel and to be able to preach the truth of God's word, to call sinners to repentance, and to rightly proclaim the word of truth. To do that, they must be uh, set aside and, and sent and provided for so that they can complete that study, so that they can have the time to uh, give to the preparation and the uh, work of ministry. And so we need to have missionaries sent. We need to have pastors equipped and sent. I'm so proud, uh, honored really, to be proud, part of this, pat, um, this parish. This parish which has sent out so many pastors and provided so many pastors' wives, both in our AFLC and in other denominations. It's a wonderful thing. I uh, think back, too, of the pastor who was my pastor before I went to seminary, Pastor Marlon Cruz. At his funeral, I noted there were 12 pastors in attendance at his funeral, and three of those pastors had previously been his parishioners. He was a man who not only called people to believe in Jesus, but he equipped others to share that word and to carry on the work that he could only do for a short time in this life, as any of us can only do for a short time in this life. So we, we, we see that need of those being sent, but how does it happen? And we, we think of that call and provision that we help and assist with some of our uh, students who go to Bible school. We provide that uh, scholarship. And, and for those from the parish uh, who have gone to seminary, we've helped them out. We also provide for all the seminarians a, a Christmas gift from Mount Carmel here to uh, help them through their studies and paying their expenses. And, and we get many, many thank yous back of what a difference that has made, even the, the small amount that our gift ends up being for each one of them as it's broken down by the number of students. But we see that sending is also recognizing that the church that sends won't have that person there anymore. We need to still trust the Lord to continue the work among us. We need to trust the Lord to uh, provide even for us, but we need that focus to be on the outside of ourselves. Our focus needs to be on reaching the lost, on proclaiming God's truth. If we become one of those churches that's inwardly focused, that's just bent on survival, well, we lose our main purpose, and, and, and then really the object of survival becomes something other than the gospel, and we need to be careful of that. So we see here, as Paul presents this uh, mountain of faith, how do we come to know the Lord? It comes when we call upon him. All who call upon him will be saved, and as we approach that, it comes from faith, from confession, 
and belief. And, but to get there, then he goes down the other side, how we need to hear. We need to have someone sent so that we can hear. And yet, even with that, he brings up the other side, that many hear and yet do not believe. And yet, God continues to provide. God continues to make his appeal. God continues to send out the missionaries and the pastors and, and the believers from among the congregation into the community so that people can hear again and again, even when they have rejected it. Because we see that that call is the result of faith. When we read in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, that's part of our faith. We have to believe God exists. We have to know of him, but then to learn that we can not only know of him, but we can know him and draw near through faith in Christ, and that he rewards them, those who seek him. That it's not just a futile pursuit to try to reach out to a God who's maybe out there someplace, but he's a God who's real. He's a God who loves you. He's a God who's spoken to you through his word. He's a God who sent his only son to die for your sins so that you may know the forgiveness that you might be reconciled with him so that you receive that joy of sins forgiven and you are equipped to walk with him and reflect his grace and his glory to those around you. And so we see that the result of faith is to call upon him. We've got to believe in him. We've got to know that it's worthwhile to call before we will. And then to get there, we have to believe. To believe, we have to hear of God. We have to understand who he is and what he's done. We have to know that he is a God of love who welcomes us even when we've been hard-hearted, who welcomes us even when we've been sinful. In fact, it's because we've been sinful. When we admit our sin and see that that has separated us from God, that's the, really the first step in coming and being reconciled to him and being welcomed by him. That's the kind of person that God loves. And so we see that the value of going to church isn't that it makes me a good person. But the value of going to church is that I can there hear the word of God preached. I can hear the good news that Jesus died to save sinners. I can hear the law. What does God require that maybe I haven't done? That eventually we discover not just maybe, but for sure I haven't done. That we are separated from God because of our sin. We only come to really understand and realize that when we hear from his word. And that from that, though, we can be forgiven. We can be reconciled and put back together with him, and we can be made new. And so we find that value of coming to church isn't that it makes me a good person. It isn't that I gain points with God if I go to church, but I can hear I can hear the word of God and I can be instructed so that my faith will grow. My understanding can be set on a solid foundation if the pastor is preaching the word rightly and that we can then come to know God. We can come to have that assurance of salvation, the assurance of sins forgiven and that reconciliation with God. And so we see it comes from hearing, and for that to happen, a preacher needs to be sent again. But then, when we hear, the words must be met with faith. We need to respond. He says, who has, uh, not only is how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but then in verse 16, 
but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And so we need to meet that preaching, that hearing with faith, to believe who God is, to understand our relationship with him outside of Christ, and then to understand our relationship with him in Christ, and to call upon him because of recognizing that need. Who has obeyed the gospel, it says, that call to faith? And yet, for the people of Israel, it wasn't that they didn't hear. It says they heard, but they didn't believe and they didn't obey, and therefore they haven't called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. And that happens to yet today, even in our own community. There are those who hear. There are those who understand fully what God expects of them and that they are separated. But they are unconcerned. They see that not as a problem because they don't believe it's true. They don't believe the consequence of not following God will be eternal separation. Or they may believe that, but they don't think it'll be a big deal because they don't see God as the good guy. They see God as the bad guy, somebody to be avoided, someone to run away from, someone to hide from, just in the same way as someone committing a crime will seek to hide from the police and dodge into the shadows so they cannot be seen. So many people hide from God. They avoid the preaching of his word. They avoid those who proclaim the gospel because they want to be their own little God. They want to live their own life. And God in his mercy lets them. But it's unfortunate that it, it's a path that Jesus says leads to destruction. It leads away from the Lord. And so we see here, uh, I asked, did they not understand? But Moses has said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. We, we see there how God uses the foolishness of this world to shame those who are wise in the ways of this world, but to bring them to understand that God is greater and to use their jealousy. Why do they have the blessing of God? Why do the good things happen there? And, and how can they come through even the trials with a joy in the Lord when it so knocks me down? And through seeing that, then they also are reminded of the call of God to faith, the call to believe, the call to come and call out to him and that invitation. And so we see that uh, those who are uh, turning away, he describes them then in verse 21. God says, I have all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. Disobedient, that means turning away from the things God wants. They'll excuse them. They'll uh, come up with some uh, re rationalization. You know, Proverbs says, every man's way is right in his own eyes. And I've often heard those who've turned away from God's ways and they're uh, giving themselves over to a lifestyle or, or choices or sinfulness that is definitely against God's word. But they'll have some reason they think it's important. They'll say, oh, I can't do it any other way. Or you don't know what I've been through and why I need to do this. And they'll have a lot of excuses, but the end result is they turn from God. They turn away from his word, and then it says they're contrary. Contrary is that going against Whatever idea God presents, they're going to want to go the other way. Every suggestion that God gives, they will discount and say, no, that won't work. 
any call that God gives. They will ignore and run the other way. It's much like Jonah when he was called to preach to the people of Nineveh. What was his first response? He got a ship to Tarshish, the other end of the Mediterranean Sea, to run as far from God's call as he could go. But how does God respond? Does he kick us out? Does he respond by hating us? No. He responds by loving us all the more. Jonah was brought to an end of himself and given another chance. And in the same way, the Israelites, as they turned again and again, even though they got sent into exile, God brought them back, allowed them to rebuild the temple and the wall of Jerusalem. And while it wasn't quite the same, he sent them, he allowed them to live again in their homeland, though they were no longer sovereign over it. And then he sent them a savior, even though they were so busy following other ways, even though they had it totally upside down and backwards, how to seek after God, God sent him there, God sent them his son. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, but on the third day he rose again. For this disobedient and contrary people are the people that God loves. And that means whatever you've done, there's hope for you. No matter how far you've strayed, there is an opportunity again to turn to the Lord. As long as we're in this life, he is calling, he is inviting, he is opening the door to salvation, to forgiveness, to faith. And so, again, we hear that word of the gospel that God loves you. God loves sinners. And because God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And it continues, as he says, all the day long, he didn't just hold his hand out for a moment. He didn't just hold his hand out for a short time, but he continues to hold his hand out to those who have been disobedient and contrary, that they may come, that they may hear, that they may believe, and that they may be brought to call out to him, knowing that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May we call upon him, today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this call. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for the way that you allow us to participate in training and sending men into the ministry and, and, and in witnessing ourselves and in instructing our young people that they might walk with you. Lord, bless our efforts and use them. And Lord, may those who go out be able to Clearly proclaim your word that none may have excuse. And Lord, by your spirit, may you work in hearts and lives to grow faith, to plant that seed, to bring it to germination and, 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 and to bring it to fruit. A fruit of faith in the lives of many. A fruit of belief and walking with you and calling out to you, recognizing you as a great and almighty God recognizing your Son as the only Savior and drawing near through faith and forgiveness, accepting your gift, the gift of salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would build that faith in us and use us, Lord, to build that faith in others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Now bow your hearts and receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's grace. <laughs>